Thank you, Jane, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be able to discuss with you uh, some aspects of this model. Um, as some of you may know, the theory of planned behavior is probably the most widely used conceptual framework in the uh, social and behavioral sciences. Uh, well over a thousand papers, published papers, have used this uh, model in a variety of uh, applications and, and theoretical conceptual uh, studies. Um, I, my understanding of this meeting is that this is rather informal, and I'd like to uh, keep it that way, so I, I want to encourage you all to interrupt at any point and uh, raise questions or argue with me, disagree with me, uh, whatever, um, because I would like to have a bit of a, a discussion and some feedback from you to see what your interests and concerns might be to the extent that you're interested in using this kind of an approach. Um, let me just to first of all load the file this by pres uh, PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. Okay. Um, the theory of planned behavior, uh, Francesca already gave you a bit of an overview, so I won't uh, repeat that. I s suppose most of you are familiar with it. Let me just make one or two points that, that Francesco had made. So the um, behavior seemed to be a function uh, in an immediate sense of the intention, although the effect of the intention is moderated by control. That is, you can carry out your intention to the extent that you have control over the behavior. The, the question that um, uh, is perhaps of greater interest is where do these intentions come from and there the theory postulates three main considerations as people consider engaging in a behavior they think about it and come up with sort of three types of considerations one we term behavioral beliefs these are beliefs about the likely consequences of behavior so to perform the behavior will it produce positive outcomes or negative outcomes uh, and in the aggregate, these beliefs lead to the formation of an attitude towards the behavior, favorable, unfavorable attitude towards the behavior. A similar idea is uh, related to uh, the normative uh, component in the model. The idea here is that uh, people believe that certain important others, like their friends, parents, and so on, uh, would want them to perform the behavior or not to perform the behavior, and they also can see what other people do, and all that exerts a social pressure for them to engage in the behavior or not, which we call the subjective norm. And then finally, there are considerations that have to do with the ease or difficulty of performing behavior. What kinds of factors might make it easier? What kinds of factors in your life might make it more difficult? You take all of those things in, in combination, and they lead to the formation of what uh, Bandura called uh, perceived self-efficacy or what we call perceived behavioral control in this model. So we have these three kinds of factors. Now the point I was trying to make here that um, Francesco had made is that the belief, at the belief level is where you get uh, the most interesting substantive information about the uh, the considerations, the causal factors, what leads people to form an intention to engage in the behavior. Now, it's, it's one thing to say, well, people intend to uh, have uh, you know, another child in the next three years because they have a favorable attitude towards having life. Okay, that's fine. But why do they have a favorable attitude? There you have to go to the level of the beliefs to see what kinds of consequences they think will be uh, uh, will follow from having another child. And um, how, do, how do we find out about that, these beliefs? Well, what you saw in the presentation, uh, but Francesca's, but especially Jane's, is that uh, often people will just make up a few items to ask about likely consequences. That may come out of some past research that, that has been done on this topic or, or their own intuition. That's really not good enough. 
Um, in fact, I think the, the, the reason this model has been used as frequently as it has is because it is a fairly simple model. If you look at it, there are three main factors in it leading to intention and the intention to behavior. And so you think, well, that's easy, I'll do that. It don't take me five minutes to make up a questionnaire and I can go out and, well, it's not that simple. Um, the, in fact, you know, we, uh, Jane mentioned that I just published a, a monograph with Marty Fishbein that summarized uh, basically all the research, uh, the findings, conclusions based on all the research that uh, has been conducted with this model. And in one of these chapters for the book, we were looking, trying to identify some uh, studies that we could use as examples of a good, solid application of the model. And it was very difficult to find one, including among our own research, which tell, tells you something. It is not that easy to use this model in, in a way that, that really answers all your questions and, and, and has a, a proper oper operation of all the constructs. Uh, so the, you go to the level of the beliefs, and what I'll, we'll be discussing more in a little while, uh, it, you cannot simply assume that you know what people think. You have to ask them. And so what, you, what needs to be done is you need to do some uh, formative research, uh, pilot studies, in which you elicit these beliefs. In other words, you'd ask people, if you were to have another child, or if you were to engage, or if you could get married, or, or leave home, or whatever the behavior might be, what would be the consequences? What would be the advantages of doing this? What are the disadvantages of doing this? Who would approve of it, and who would disapprove of it? to get at the normative reference. Uh, what kinds of factors would make it easier? What kinds of factors would make it more difficult? We get that information from a representative sample of the population. Okay? We cannot simply assume that we know it. And it's only once you have that information that you can construct a, a theory of planned behavior questionnaire that will give you the, the, what, what you really want to know. Um, and then there are the background factors that were mentioned. I'm not going to go into this except to say that the, uh, you, you know, the, the theory doesn't really tell you what background factors you should take into consideration. That's something you have to decide for yourself, what might be important. And for different behaviors, different kinds of background factors will turn out to be important. But once you have identified those, you can trace their influence in the theory. So you could, um, you could find out whether, uh, let's say, level of education influences intentions because it has an effect on the likely consequences of the behavior, the perceived consequences of the behavior, or because people who are, have a higher level of education have different normative beliefs, or different, maybe they suffer from different kinds of control issues. And so you can find out why it is that a certain background factor influences behavior, or why it fails to do so. Okay. Now let me start by, what I will try to do is um, touch upon maybe two, three issues related to uh, the application of this model. And we can spend as much time or as little time as you'd like on each of these. So if we, as we go along, if uh, you find something to be of interest to you, let me know and we can, can spend more time on it. We don't have to get through all of this. As I say, this is very informal and so we can see where the discussion leads. All right, there's a question of compatibility, both uh, Francesco and Jane alluded to it. Um, you want to make sure, within this model, maybe the, the, mo the, the most important thing to do is the, uh, to define the behavior clearly that you're interested in. It is a be it's a model of individual decision making related to the performance of a particular behavior. Okay, so you have to define exactly what it is you're interested in. Um, and you, you can think of any behavior as involving four elements. The action that's performed, the target at which the action is directed, the context in which it occurs, and the time frame. And so once you have defined your behavior in, in those terms, then everything else in the model follows because then you would have to measure the intention to perform that very behavior as defined and the attitude towards that behavior and subjective norm with respect to that behavior and so on. 
Okay? So it's that initial definition of the behavior that really should guide your con construction of your questionnaire. In the RETPRO project, unfortunately, that was not exactly done. Um, the different kinds of behaviors, but for some of them, the, the items are better than for others, but overall, we have some issues here as to exactly how this was done. So here's an example. Uh, this, discussing to have a child in the coming year, that would be, a, let's say, we define that as the action. Uh, with my partner, that's the target, over dinner would be the context on Friday night. So here is somebody who's thinking about discussing that that uh, question of having another child or having a child in the coming year. Um, so if that's what you're interested in, then what, what you would have to do, it, you'd have to ask people their intentions to do that on Friday night. Right? And their attitudes towards doing this on Friday night and so forth. Of course, you might ask yourself, why would anybody be interested in this, whether you discuss with your partner having another child this Friday night. I mean, maybe it would be okay if they discussed it any time within the next three months. I mean, why this Friday night? So that, but it is up to you to define what is of importance to you. If it is of importance to you to know what's going to happen this Friday night, then you have to ask the intention about that particular event, okay, that particular behavior. And another example, discussing with my partner, you could define that as the action. To have a child in the coming year would be the target over dinner the country. The point I'm trying to make here is that there is some flexibility in what you call the action, what you call the target, and the context. But once you have defined that, then everything else should be in this exactly the same way. Um, here's another example. That doesn't have a child in the coming year is the action with my partner to target next week. So here the time frame is a bit more open and no context element is defined in, in this example. You can set it up any way you want. But once you have made your decision on the behavior you want to study, then the rest of the questionnaire should follow that decision. So and here's the, the principle of compatibility. Basically, the idea is why, would we, why are we so concerned about defining the behavior clearly? It's because if you want to be able to predict it and ultimately explain it, you have to maintain what, what we know empirically is that it works well only if you maintain strict compatibility. If, you're the, if, if the criterion, the elements that you have defined in terms of criterion behavior are maintained at exactly the same level in all your predictors. Okay? Um, and so let me give you some, some empirical evidence for that. This is a, going back quite a few years, we did a survey of studies that had been published at the time concerning the relation between attitudes and behavior. And we divided the studies up to there were, I think, about 142 data sets in, in that analysis. And we divided those studies up into those that had measured attitudes and behavior at compatible levels, at exactly the same in terms of all the elements, or incompatible, and some studies had sort of a mixture, some degree of compatibility, but not, not complete. And so what we found was that if you had complete incompatibility, that is, the attitude was measured at some very broad level usually, the behavior was a very specific behavior, the correlations are close to zero. With partial compatibility, it's not a lot better. You only get really good, strong correlations between the attitude and the behavior when you maintain good compatibility. Now, these, this was across different studies, and we had to decide how much compatibility was involved in any given study. There are also some studies that have made that comparison directly. Um, I'll get to that. I think I'll have that in a minute. But anyway, the idea here is then that um, you can have compatibility at different levels. It doesn't, the behavior doesn't have to be very specific. I think there's some misunderstanding sometimes that we have to, for this theory to work, you have to define the behavior at a very low level to be very specific. So what exactly are you going to do at what time and so on? That's not necessarily the case. What the comp principle of compatibility says is that you have to maintain compatibility. It could be at a high level of generality or at a low level of generality, so long it's compatible or the same. So you could have an attitude towards a general target, um, let's say attitude towards religion or attitude towards uh, homosexuals. But then your behavior will have to be equally broad 
That is, you have to find a, 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 a complex of behaviors that represent this general, general level of, of, uh, of a disposition. Alternatively, you can, you can look at specific behaviors, but then you have to measure the attitude towards that specific behavior. And the question is, do you get any relations, correlations when you measure attitudes very broadly and try to use that attitude to predict specific behaviors? And the answer is no. Um, here's a study, well, this is a meta-analysis of some eight studies. So here, they, here were some studies where they measured general attitudes towards the target and tried to sp predict a specific behavior, and the average correlation was a 0.13. But if you measured the attitude towards the behavior in that same study, the correlation, average correlation goes up to 0.54. So all, all, what that tells us is that when you're trying to understand relatively specific behaviors, what you need to do is to measure your predictors, your attitudes, norms, control, intentions, at that same level as the specific behavior. So if we try to look at that in the context of um, fertility decisions, um, Well, let, me, let me make one, one other point first. Um, the reason that uh, general attitudes or general measures of general constructs don't predict specific behaviors very well is that, from at least within the context of the theory, different behaviors um, different beliefs become accessible as you think about performing different behaviors. So in other words, even if you, met, if you just change one element, you start thinking about it differently. So for example, if you think about having a child within this coming year, as opposed to having a child, let's say, in 10, year, in 10 years' time, different kinds of considerations will pop up, will, will be accessible. This coming year, you might say to yourself, well, you know, I can't really do it right now. I have all these commitments at work, and, and it really would interfere, and, I, and my life is already difficult enough, and so on. Yeah, sure, in 10 years' time, it, it's a very different picture, right? So um, we, have, we cannot assume that one broad construct will predict and explain each of these different behaviors, or, or behaviors performed at different points in time even, because there are different kinds of considerations associated with the behavior as you change the time frame. The same about changing the context or changing the action that's involved. Every time you change one of these elements, the considerations that guide people's behavior start to change. And broad attitudes or values don't reflect that since they don't deal with a specific behavior. All right, so here, if you think about becoming pregnant now, Right? That's one thing. Having another child or a child in the next three years, that's somewhat different. Having a child with my current partner in the next three years. So, you know, now you put a context into it. And that may be different. You know, yeah, maybe I, I'd like to have a child in the next three years, but not with my current partner. Maybe that, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, having another child before I'm turning 40. Now, you know, when you start, when I put it that way to you, you might start to think, well, if I don't have a child before I'm turning 40, maybe I'll never have children. So, you know, different kinds of things become activated. Number of children completed family, again, you know, it all looks like it's, well, isn't it all the same? No, it's not. All these things involve very different kinds of considerations. And then if you, what about you turn it around? Not having any children, not having any more children. Again, different kinds of things come to mind when you, when you phrase it that way, when you think about the behavior that way. Um, so, maybe I should stop for a second. Are there any comments or questions, issues?
just a small clarifying question. Is this theory intended to be applied for important decisions of life or even like small consumer decisions? Well, the theory is, is a general theory that's supposed to work for any kind of decision, whether it's a minor decision or a major one. Of course, the amount of time people are likely to, in an effort people are likely to invest uh, prior to making a decision will vary depending on how, how important the decision is. So if you're thinking about having a child, I would, I would hope that most people give it some thought, right? But if you're thinking about buying ice cream, you know, yeah, okay, so you make that decision on the spur of the moment, right? And there are sort of implicit processes that take place so that behaviors that we have performed repeatedly, we don't have to think about it much anymore. So if, if I, you know, get out of the house in the morning and, and go to work and I have to think, am I going to go left or right? I mean, you know, it's something I've done so often I, I can do it without thinking. Um, but the, the model is supposed to be able to deal with all of these kinds of decisions, yes. Uh, I was wondering, there is um, one area which uh, might not be captured completely by the three uh, elements, which is the area of, um, well, generally speaking, emotion, but let's say more specific, anticipated emotions. Um, in terms of the TACT, you have a target, you have an action, you have a context, you have a time, and then there is an outcome. The outcome is behavior. I wonder whether, in your opinion, how much can it add? I think especially in these kind of situations, um, questions concerning how would you feel concern on the outcome. So, for instance, um, the joy of having a child or the regret of not having a child or the happiness, or whatever. I mean, I wonder whether these anticipated emotions might have an effect in part mediated by intention but also directly on behavior, given that there is some literature on effective forecasting showing that people use emotions, perhaps they are not very good in anticipating how they would feel at the time, but still they do use their feeling of how I will feel in terms of making decisions now. So I wonder whether you think this is something which could be meaningfully added to the model. Um, so it's a very good question. It's some, something that is uh, raised repeatedly very often um, by, by People are concerned that the theory is too rational or you know, cognitive and doesn't take emotions into account. Now, first of all, I'm, I, I should say that the theory is not a theory of rational behavior. It is uh, what we've called this framework in general uh, a reasoned action framework. So we would assume that, that behavior is reasoned, that people think about what they want to do, but it's not necessarily rational. So emotions can certainly play in simply by influencing what people believe is true. So, you know, my, I can have wishful thinking, for example. So, because I would like so something to happen, I may believe that it's going to happen, right? And so emotions can influ impact my beliefs. Emotions can also impact my evaluations of the outcomes. So I can say, just, you know, because something feels good to me, I can say that it's a desirable outcome, okay? Um, but more specifically to your, your question about anticipated affect, um, I will be talking about that and get, show you some data in, in a minute, so I will delay giving you a full answer to it. But basically, within the theory, an anticipated emotion is just like any other anticipated outcome. Okay, so I may believe that having a child will, will uh, cause uh, you know, financial difficulties, and I can also believe that having another child will make me proud and happy. That would be anticipated emotions. Right? Uh, the both, both types of outcomes, emotional and non-emotional, are supposed to influence my attitude towards, the, towards having another child. Okay? There's still a, some issues related to that, and I will get back to it if you don't mind. Any, anything else? Okay, so let me first, though, before we get to this anticipated emotion, um, talk a little bit about the intention behavior question because the, the fundamental assumption in this model is that 
the immediate antecedent of the behavior, what, what determines the behavior in the immediate sense, is the intention to perform the behavior. Um, unfortunately, people don't always act on their intentions, as we well know. Um, so here is... Um, <coughs> Well, it depends on the intention, right? <laughs> um, but for, from our perspective, it may be unfortunate if you're trying to predict behavior. Um, he, this is a summary of some six studies uh, by Sheeran uh, in the health domain. And so what Sheeran did, uh, he looked at whether people expressed an intention to perform a behavior or not, not to perform the behavior. And his behaviors had to do with using condoms, um, getting cancer screening, and exercising and then whether people actually did or did not perform those behaviors. Now what you can see is when um, people say, no, I don't intend to use condoms, I don't intend to exercise, I don't intend to get a cancer screening, they don't for the most part. There are very few people who actually go ahead and do it anyhow. But if you look at those who say, yes, they intend to do it, about half don't. Now we're all familiar with the phenomenon, how many of you have formed an intention to start exercising and and then have not done it, right, or dieting or whatever. So uh, we're, we're familiar with the phenomenon. It's um, maybe, maybe not surprising, but the question is, you know, what exactly is going on here? Why, why do we have that gap in it? And it arises in the fertility context because there is a basic assumption, or an assumption, but it's data that seems to suggest to people that, um, that, that the number of children people want or intend to have is higher than the number of children they actually have in, in Euro most European countries. Um, and that is considered to be an, an interesting finding because it would then suggest that if you wanted to raise the um, fertility rate, all you needed to do would be to uh, allow people to carry out their intentions, right, to, to, to achieve that desired number of children. Um, actually, Jane and I were discussing this yesterday and, and found out that this data that seems to suggest that this fertility gap is really not as, as persuasive as one might think. But um, nevertheless, assuming there is such a gap, what is responsible for it? And then a number of different uh, possibilities as to uh, why, uh, I think I'm going to skip over this one, um, why intentions may not necessarily produce the corresponding behavior. Um, one, and it has good support for that in the fertility domain, one, one uh, reason is that people's intentions change. I mean, you know, childbirth is an ex occurs over an extended period of time. And if I ask you early on in your reproductive years, how many children do you intend to have, or do you have, intend to have, you know, a certain number of children in a certain period of time, you might say yes, but you can change your mind, right? So maybe you tend to have three children. After your first child, you say, oh, maybe two is enough, you know? So um, it isn't really that you have fewer children than you desire to have, but more that your desire changes as to what you intend to change. Right? Um, another possibility, though, and that is sort of more interesting from a psychological perspective, is that the question of desired number of children is really a hypothetical. Um, so yeah, it would be nice, you know, but it may be not very practical. And so when I ask you this desired number of children, you, you, you give me what you think is nice, what is sort of socially acceptable, what, is, what everybody you know, think, seems to think is, is, is what you should do. Whereas in fact, you may, you may personally may not really, when it comes to it, may not make that decision to have another child. We did some research in a completely different domain that illustrates this point. This has to do with, um, um, well, it's, it's work that, that originates in, in economics and has to do with contingent valuation, the, the question of assigning monetary values to goods that are not traded in the marketplace. And the way that economists try to do it, or some economists try to do it, is to ask people, how much money would you be willing to pay if a market existed for this particular kind of product? Um, and of course, once you do that, you run into problems of psychological measurement, of reliability and validity and so forth. And what you find is a 
what, what has been called a, a, a hypothetical bias, a gap between intentions and behavior. Let me show you this bias. We used college students and we asked them, we brought them in together in, in small groups. We told them that we, we, they will be voting on a proposition and if the majority in the group approves the proposition, then a certain amount of money will be paid. And the money was to go for a uh, scholarship fund. So everyone here in this room will contribute a certain amount of money that was specified to them and varied across conditions. They contribute a certain amount of money to the University of Massachusetts Amherst Scholarship Fund, the contributions used to provide scholarship aid to needy and deserving students at UMass Amherst. And then they were asked to cast a vote, and the vote was tallied. Now, in one condition of the experiment, we told them this is really just hypothetical. I mean, in other words, you're not going to have to pay anything. We just want to know if, in theory, people would be willing to pay a certain amount of money for, to this fund. In the other condition, we told them that if the majority of people in this group vote yes, then you will actually have to pay the money. All right? So we, had, we varied the, num the amount of money that we asked them to pay for one, three, five, and eight dollars. And this is in a hypothetical condition. So about 70% voted yes, and it, the amount of money didn't make any difference. But then in the condition where they were told that yes, they would have to pay the money, you can see that it, it made it, you know, sure, a dollar people were willing to pay, but it went, came to three or five or eight dollars, you know. Uh, so what is going on here? Why do we get this? Um, within the theory of planned behavior, the explanation for this is quite simple. When you are, when you think that this is for real, you really have to pay the money, the beliefs that are activated, that are uh, readily accessible, to some extent are different than the beliefs that are accessible and activated when it's hypothetical. When it's for real, you start to think about, well, you know, $8, I mean, I could go to a movie, or I could buy some groceries, or, could, you know. Um, but if it's hypothetical, that doesn't really matter. You're not going to lose the money, so you're just thinking about the positives of helping the needy students. And so we actually collected some data to show this. We administered a, a theory of planned behavior questionnaire prior to the vote in the hypothetical and the real conditions. And you can see that the attitude is more negative in the real condition. Subjective norms are, are more negative in the real condition. Here people basically saying, well, what would my parents want me to do? Would they want me to give money to a scholarship fund? when they are supporting me here at the university, right? Should I be using that money to support somebody else? Um, perceived control was a bit lower and the intentions were lower. So people are thinking about it differently when, they, when it's hypothetical and when it's real. And I think the same kind of thing happens with ch when you think about having a child or how many children you want to have. At the hypothetical level, it sounds very good. But when it comes to the actual decision to stop using contraceptive and how to get pregnant and have a child, all kinds of other issues pop up. And then you decide maybe better not. Okay. Questions, comments? Yes, please. Just a very small question. Because here you are talking about intentions all the time, no? And, uh, and you are treating a express intention as intentions. And I have troubles with that because I believe people lie a lot. Okay, so, so and the, the thing, I mean, you're talking a lot about fertility and infertility is very easy to lie, you know, because I mean, much of the, the action is hidden, uh, normally hidden within the couple and even, I mean, in a couple, uh, within the couple, it could be hidden, the attitudes, no? I mean, uh, a woman could be taking contraceptives and not telling the partner. Or, or no. There are many, many ways of, of doing this. So, I don't know, and I haven't listened to that into your talk about how you treat this, this, this difference between intentions and expressed intentions and uh, whether there is any alternative way of looking into this. So, I, I don't know whether this makes sense or not. Huh? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a serious issue. With any kind of self-report, it's a question of how accurate are the self-reports. You know, you ask people about their behavior. 
Have you paid your income taxes? You know, how many people are going to tell you the truth? Um, so when you're getting self-reports, there's always a possibility that people will, either because they don't want you to know or because they themselves are not exactly sure. Okay? So... Uh, Well, with children, it's you can't. You're not, not going to hide the children either. So if you say you're going to, you have, intend to have a child in the next three years, and I come back three years later and you don't have a child, I know that you didn't carry out your intention, or maybe you didn't tell me the truth. But the question still is, can I can I rely on the intention? What do the intentions I measure, right? Um, and so it's a question of validating the the measurement. And there is good evidence to, to suggest that intentions, by and large, are pretty good. Expressed intentions do predict behavior. We can account in many studies for as much as you know, 40, 50 percent of the observed variance in behavior on the basis of just intentions. Okay? So, it's, yeah, some people may be lying. Some people may give you an intention that they, you know, not so sure about, but they express it as if it was real, and so on. And there's error in it, but it's not that it's completely useless, right? The intentions do predict behavior. I mean, there are hundreds of studies that have looked at the relation between intentions and behavior, and the correlations are pretty good. The, uh, the example you gave us in, in, in the paper you were referring to are, in a sense, very different from one another. So having a, a cancer, cancer um, screening or, uh, or deciding whether you want to give money to an individual or not, those are very different things. Because, I mean, what, the last example you gave us is the typical thing of, like, put the money where your big mouth is, right? Like, you know, you're talking a lot, but let me see whether you actually... Uh, in, in the other, and so like, those are cases in which probably most of the utility you get out of it is given by the expression of what you will be doing, not from the fact itself. So you know, if you can say that you've been very generous, that would do it, even if you don't do it. I mean, that would be enough, right? But the, in the medical case, it's a little bit, I mean, it's a little bit different because then you're internalizing everything. It's not a question of expressing, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter whether you say that you're going to have a, a screen, uh, you know, whether you get, get yourself screened or not, because the, the important thing is whether you actually do it. So don't you think that we get different kind of insight from people responding, you know, like from the, the, the difference between what people intend to do and what they actually do? I mean, how can we interpret the fact that they say we are, we are going to do it, but then we don't do it in terms of the, the medical screening? Uh, is it because people don't think too much when they answer? I mean, one point you were making before is that, you know, depending on the type of decision that I'm making, uh, if I think it's a very important decision, then I think through it. Otherwise, I don't. So it, could it just be that, you know, people, when they're exposed to this survey, they just don't think about it too much, even though they're relevant problems. And you know. Yeah, I, I think you're right that different kinds of decisions, even though on the surface the pattern looks the same, where people say they'll do something, but then they don't. It's an asymmetric gap. It's, it's very rare that people say they're not going to do something, but then they do it. It's only in the case of negative behaviors you get that. But in the case of socially desirable behaviors, the pattern is that you don't do if you say you, you're not going to do it. But if you s express an intention to do it, then often you don't. Okay. Now, the reason for that discrepancy is probably different in different kinds of decisions. Okay. So when it comes to this, you know, spending money on, on a scholarship fund, maybe what really drives it is that you're concerned what your parents are going to say if you spend the money on that. If it comes to medical decisions, it may be a very different process. Um, I think in the medical context, what happens is that people truly uh, intend to do it. Okay. But what does it mean? See, there's research showing that... Um, it, has, it, has, it sometimes has to do with the time perspective. When you think about something in the long term, the, the, the considerations, the beliefs, 
that the processes that you go through are fairly abstract. And you think about sort of the, the in theory, the desirable kinds of, of outcomes of, of exercising or whatever. And when, you, when it's something that, when it comes close in time to do it, then in addition to those kinds of more general issues, you some much more concrete uh, problems come up. So then you start thinking, well, next week I'm going to see the doctor. No, I can't next week. I'm going to be out of town, and then I'm going down. And so there are all kinds of constraints. You, you don't think about them in the long term, but they become much more important in the short term. And I think what you have with, with health-related things is, that is procrastination, basically. So yes, you intend to do it, but not right now. And you keep pushing it off and pushing it off, and then a year has passed and you still haven't done it. Right? We do know that people, even when they intend to do things, they express intention and sometimes they even pay for it and then they don't do it because th think about the exercise. A lot of people pay money to, to, get, to actually get like, uh, to go to the gym and then they don't, right? So in that case, they're actually expressing something. Those are all important issues. Uh, I mean, intentions, you know, it's, it's not the cure-all. It's not, you can't just assume that people will always do what they say they intend to do. But by and large, it's, it, it's probably the best predictor we have at the individual level. And so we work with it, and you try to um, make your measure as, as good a measure as you can. So to avoid, you know, people lying to you, you're assure them of anonymity and confidentiality and all those kinds of things. And, and it helps to some extent. Or if, as in some studies, what people have done is to uh, offer, offer money to, and, and uh, tell, you know, if, if, they, if they tell the truth, then they will be, later on, they will be rewarded in one way or another and so on. So you, people are aware of the problems of self-reports, including measuring intentions. But in, for most behaviors, there is no particularly good motivation for people to lie. And so, by and large, most people will tell you what they currently intend to do. But there are, there are certainly certain kinds of decisions where you have to be suspicious as to whether people tell you the truth. Yeah. Still uh, continuing on this issue, uh, but from a slightly different angle. I mean, one of your uh, distal predictors of um, you know, the three basic blocks which leads to intention so was personality. I was wondering if you could think of personality also, at least some personality dimensions. Uh, I make one specific example. In, in the field of health-related behavior, before this was mentioned, conscientiousness has been shown to be, or, you know, in several studies to be a, a very good, relatively good predictor of several health-related behaviors. And in some studies, this has been shown also uh, over and above intentions to behave health. In other studies, it has been shown as a moderator of the strength of the link between intention and behavior. So I wonder whether you think that in a more general case, a personality can also help at least some personal dimensions, can also help to reduce the gap between intention and behavior. Yes, there, I mean, there are reasons, as I said before, for why people don't carry out their intentions. One that I mentioned in the health domain is this procrastination, that you keep pushing it off. If you're a more conscientious person, you will be less likely to do so, and then you're more likely to carry out your intention. There is a, um, a very simple intervention method uh, developed by, by Peter Goldwitz, so you, you may be familiar with implementation intentions, uh, where all, all you, they do is after they've expressed an intention to, let's say, get a cancer screening, then, then the people are asked, well, when, where, and how are you going to do it? And that's all, and it tends to radically close the gap between intentions and behavior. Because now people have made sort of a commitment. They have specified a time. It's not something sometime in the future. It's a specific point in time in a specific place. And once you've done that, it becomes much more likely that you will actually carry out your intention. 
that can interact also with, with conscientiousness and, or other personality factors. And again, some people are more likely to actually remember what they dis, you know, decided to do, some are more likely to, and so they like prospective memory, which becomes an important factor. Um, implementation intentions seem to help with pr prospective memory, and then they activate the intention at the right time. Um, other factors like conscientiousness may simply, you know, people who are more conscientious, maybe they make some notes to themselves entered in their calendar or in their, in their telephone to remind them that they, have, you know, whatever. So there are all kinds of strategies people can use and that individual differences as to how, you know, how much people try to actually do what they intend to do. All right. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, have you worried at all about cognitive dissonance issues? It could be the case that somebody cognitive dissonance, somebody states uh, an intention or perhaps it's not really what he intended to do, but since he stated that, he will not want to, to do something different than that? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, in fact, there is evidence to show that once people have expressed an intention, they're more likely to actually perform the behavior than a comparable sample of people who were not asked to express an intention. And it has been, been found in, in behaviors of, of considerable importance, or, like buying an automobile, for example. It's been found that uh, when you survey people and ask them how likely is it you're going to buy a car in the next six months, within that sample, people are more likely to buy a car than in a sample where they haven't been asked. So yes, there is some uh, evidence that just asking these kinds of questions and a questionnaire can influence behavior. That's true. Um, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't invalidate any model or anything. It's just that, you know, like anything else, behavior can be influenced. Uh, if you listen, you know, to a radio program, your behavior may be influenced. If a lot of questionnaire, your behavior may be influenced. So there is, um, it, what a questionnaire will tend to do is to get you to think about the behavior and its consequences and so on. If it, in the process of doing that, you come to the conclusion that you may be, yes, you should buy a car in the next six months, and you're more likely to do it. All right, I, should, I think I should go on because there's one other thing I, I did promise that we will get to anticipated regret. Well, let me just skip over this here. This is sort of depiction of the expectancy value model of attitudes. Uh, Francesco re alluded to this, that really what we have are two elements. Here we have, if you think about a particular behavior, there is the belief or the strength of the belief that the behavior will lead a certain consequence X. Then we have the evaluation of that consequence. These two combine multiplicatively to produce, use the multiplication to produce, to influence the attitude. So the stronger you hold a certain belief and you more positively or negatively you evaluate the outcome, the more that belief will influence your attitude. Um, and as I mentioned before, I can skip over this. We, in order to inf get information about beliefs, we have to elicit them in pilot work. So we ask questions like about the advantages, disadvantages, about people who would approve or disapprove, about factors that make it easy or difficult. Um, let me just skip about some of those things because we don't need that. Uh, but here, let me show you something. See, I mentioned briefly earlier that we can think about a behavior and what are the likely consequences, who would like us to perform the behavior, and so on. But we could also formulate it and think about the opposite of not performing the behaviors. So in case of having a child, we can have, think about having a child or about not having a child. And this is a study that was done by Vinnikar Kaplan, Kaplan in the 70s, um, where she actually uh, elicited beliefs about having a child and about not having a child. And you can see that um, the beliefs aren't necessarily the same. Having another child will, might f fulfill you as a man or as a woman, give you, uh, would allow you to give yourself to others, contribute to a community society, you would feel close to your spouse and you'll feel loved and surrounded by your children. Those are the kinds of things that people mention when they think about having, or at the time in the 70s, 
when they thought about having another child. When they were asked to think about not having another child, uh, spend time alone with your spouse came up. Uh, maintain an acceptable standard of living. Have time for yourself. Advance in your career. Be able to provide for your children's education. Okay, so one is not exactly the opposite of the other psychologically. You know, it's formulated as, we can think of it as one being the opposite of the other, but when people uh, consider engaging in a behavior psychologically, it's, it doesn't produce the opposite kinds of beliefs. Francesca. Okay, but here then I will, I will think along Tommy's line that, I mean, if we explicitly elicit from people this kind of beliefs, uh, will, we, will we really get uh, the really important ones or is it just what it's surfacing on them? Uh, so the, the, the other option is to say, okay, we take this as a list and we ask to everyone to, to express, as, as in your theory, uh, beliefs about a, a set list of ideas. And they may not have thought about that, but that's probably something that would not have surfaced if we hadn't put the item in the questionnaire. So uh, I think this, this my, my idea, okay, this would be good for a start. I'm not sure for the general implementation that's the way to go. I'm not suggesting that that's what we should do. What I'm suggest on saying, saying is, you remember how I said at the beginning that the first thing you do when you, if you want to use this framework is to define your behavior. Okay? Now you can define your behavior as having another child or you can define it as not having another child. Either one is legitimate. Okay? But these are different behaviors. One is not just the opposite of the other, is what I'm trying to say. Okay? Now, more generally to your comment, Francesco, uh, within the theory that you, you can do one of two things. You can elicit people's beliefs and then stay at the level of, the, that, of each person's own beliefs. Now, if you ask two people about having another child, some of the beliefs that they hold will be the same and some will be different. So you could, you could analyze each person separately and, and they sort of like do case studies of individuals who hold different kinds of beliefs. Most applications of the theory don't do that. Most applications look at the beliefs that are common to, mo to most people in the population. And so you, you then construct a standard set of beliefs that would be elicited or would be emitted by the majority of people in the population. Okay. Obviously, when some of these beliefs will not necessarily be relevant for some people. Okay. But that's the compromise then, so that you can use a standard set. All right. Now, um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because, um, well, let me first show you some data. There's, there's a study that just came out. Here's a study on car use versus using alternative transportation done by Gardner and Abraham. They measured the attitudes, objective norms, perceived control with respect to using a car to predict intentions to use or not to use a car. Okay? And so in, in the first step of a regression analysis, it got a multiple correlation of 0.53, predicting intentions from these three factors. But then they also measured people's attitudes, objective norms, and control with respect to not using a car. And then did that on the next step of the regression equation, and you can see that this is not the same because this adds another 16% of the variant, of explained variance. It's by asking the opposite question. Right. Okay, now, what about anticipated affect? Um, as I said before, people have suggested that uh, there's something missing in this model. It's, not sufficiently, doesn't take into account of emotions sufficiently. And the one aspect that has to do with emotions is the anticipated affect. It comes out of research on, on decision making, on anticipated regret. The question of uh, if you don't make a certain decision, you might regret it. Um, it has been expanded to anticipated affect in general. And in fact, here's a, 
the result of a meta-analysis done by Sandberg and Connor. Here the, here the results of, um, of the, anal the, the, in the meta-analysis, the, the look like study that used the theory of planned behavior and also had a measure of anticipated affect. So if you perform this behavior, uh, would you feel sad, would you feel proud, would you feel angry, would you feel whatever. So a certain set of emotions. And what you find is that all of these factors influence intentions, including anticipated affect, has a strong effect. Um, and um, the additional amount variance accounted for by anticipated affect on the average was 7%. So you can explain an additional 7% of the variance in intentions by adding anticipated affect. Okay. Um, here's a study we did, and we just completed uh, collecting the data on this one. We looked at uh, several different behaviors. I'm showing you intentions to drink alcohol. Uh, and, and this is a student population. In the United States, at least, alcohol is a serious issue on the campus, so we looked at that as, as a behavior uh, that might be of interest. And so we'd ask people their attitudes, subjective norms, perceptions of control and intentions regarding you drinking alcohol this semester. And then we added anticipated affect. By now, what I should mention is this. When we look at the studies that have, you, have examined the effect of anticipated affect, Typically, what they do is something like this. They say, what is your attitude towards using condoms? What is your subjective norms? To, uh, what are the seat control with respect to using condoms? What are your intentions? And then they ask, if you did not use condoms, how would you feel? In other words, the anticipated regret questions are asked about the opposite of the behavior, of not performing the behavior. Okay. So we did that too in our study. We asked if you had, uh, if you had the attitudes, norms, and intentions with respect to drinking alcohol, if you had anticipated affect of avoiding alcohol, so how would you feel if you did not drink alcohol? It adds 7% of the variance. Okay. But then we did the same thing, but we asked them, what about anticipated affect of drinking? How would you feel if you did drink alcohol? Same behavior, doesn't do anything. In other words, what I believe is happening, it's not a question of emotions. It has nothing to do with emotions. It's a question of taking into account the, the right kinds of consequences, okay? If you ask people about the attitudes towards one behavior, and then you measure anticipated regret with respect to the opposite of that behavior, you get additional valuable information, as I showed you with respect to using the car. When you measure attitude towards using the car and attitude towards not using the car, you get additional information. You add up, ask about attitudes towards drinking and anticipated regrets of not drinking, you get additional information. It helps you predict. But if you ask the anticipated regret question with respect to the same behavior, it doesn't do anything. Right. Uh, you have a question. I think it's a very good point, but does it apply also when, if I ask anticipated joy, let's say, or anticipated happiness? What I mean is that uh, I think it's a very good point is the fact that it, it carries on also the variance due to the not doing, which enters from the window, let's say, rather than from the main door. So uh, I think this is a very... But, but, yeah, I wonder whether this works also the other way around. So what I mean is that um, if this example, you talk about regret or drinking, but have you measure uh, happiness or drinking? Or yes, this was not just regret. We had so is that both positive and negative? And you get the same results. Okay. I might mention that we include happiness amongst the attitude items in the, in the GGP. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's considered uh, an anticipated positive outcome. So there, it can be treated in a different way. Uh, yeah, I think we're just about out of time, yeah, right? Yeah, we're about out of time, unless 
Coming back to the previous point about uh, the two hypothetical question about the, the fertility intention, doesn't the parity level uh, exert an effect on that? Because of course, if uh, I have three children and you ask me about uh, the intention of another child, my, I mean, the question I try to answer to is not so hypothetical because I know, or at least I can anticipate it at least some effect on that. But if I'm childless, I can't. So in this second case, it could be more uh, hypothetical. Thanks. Yeah, I, I didn't mean hypothetical in that way. Um, the, the, there's a question of how much experience you've had with the behavior or with some outcome, like having a child. Um, clearly, if you're, if, if, as you're in, interviewing, surveying people at different levels of parity, um, you're going to get different results. Uh, the the beliefs that that people will uh, that, that 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 will be elicited if you ask people about the consequences of having an, a child will be different for for women who already have one, or women who have two, or women who have three. Um, both because objectively they're in a very different situation and because they have m much more experience, as, as you say. So for, for the more experienced women, you would expect that their beliefs are not likely to change much over time. They kind of know what it is like to have a child and, and so on. For women who have never had a child, their beliefs can change radically after they've had their first child. Right? So you may think that you can, you, you can balance work and, 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 uh, and uh, child rearing easily and you find out you can't and those, that belief changes, right? So yes, you're, you're right. There are very different perspectives when you're dealing with women who have had children and women who have not. Uh, when I said hypothetical, I meant that you, didn't, that you don't really think you have to do it. Okay, in that sense, hypothetical. Um, it, people routinely overestimate their own abilities, their, their intelligence, their ethical behavior, and so on. So does this illusory uh, self-concept play, could, could that play a mediating role somewhere within the model, do you think, to explain some of the, um, uh, the discrepancies? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about it, so I'll, I'll have to speculate. Um, the, it, it is true, I mean, there, it, it, there's a general tendency for people to overestimate it, so it would, have, it would presumably affect their perceptions of control, right? Um, and to the extent that it is a constant, it shouldn't matter much. So if everybody overestimates their ability to about the same extent, you just add a constant. Um, or, or subtract a constant in, in terms of the actual ability. Um, but there can, can certainly be individual differences in that. And so to the extent that you can identify, classify people, those who, who do tend to overestimate and those who don't, I would predict that those who don't overestimate their ability, you, the, the intentions will be a better predictor, right? estimate how much they know about financial instruments. I think that is uh, one uh, evidence showing that males tend to overestimate what they know more than females. Yeah. Uh, going back to the emotion, uh, the role of emotion, um, I'm not sure that uh, the role of emotion in that model uh, is not so important. Uh, it, 
Is it possible that the non-significant effect of uh, the anticipated aff affect when you are asking uh, how would you feel if you drink? Uh, it's uh, not a real, I mean, uh, in, in that situation, you're asking about uh, something that uh, uh, the decision maker or the subject already know, so the status quo uh, of the subject. So you are not adding anything and you are not uh, uh, eliminate anything. Why, you, when you are asking, asking the subject, how would you feel if you cannot do that? Uh, this is the moment in which he can anticipate any, uh, any emotion. While in this uh, situation, where you are asking, uh, how would you feel if you drink? Uh, I always drink, so uh, how would, you feel, would I feel? Uh, as always, so I would uh, not anticipate anything because I'm not thinking about differences in my, in my state of the world. Um, the opposite, I would expect to find if you, are, if you ask, uh, uh, how would you feel if you would ha will have a child or you will not have a child? Or, or uh, maybe this is not the correct example, but when you don't have something and you add something that can be positive, uh, it's possible that you will find some uh, positive uh, or significant effect of the positive emotion. So I think uh, uh, maybe the role of emotion are... Um, is salient when uh, it explains a difference between state of the world, status quo, versus uh, something that I can add or uh, delay. I, I did not mean to say that, that emotions are not important. Uh, on the contrary, I think that they are, they are very important. As I said before, first of all, they feed into my evaluations of outcomes. They may determine my, the perceived likelihood of certain outcomes. Um, and anticipated emotions also influence behavior because they influence my attitudes. Because if I think that you know, having another child will give me a lot of joy, in life, then I will have a more positive attitude towards having another child. Okay, so those all those emotions are, are important. The only question is where, that that I was trying to address here is whether having a separate measure of anticipated emotion, in addition to measuring attitudes and norms and control, whether having that additional measure explains additional variance. Okay, and on the surface, it seems that it does. But when you look more closely at the research that finds that to be the case, it, is the, it turns out that what they do is they measure attitude towards be, the, a certain behavior, and then they measure anticipated, emotion, anticipated emotions with respect to the opposite of that behavior. Okay? What I'm suggesting is that you get an additional, uh, you, you can account for additional variance by asking people to look at both sides. Right. Looking at both having a child and not having a child. Using your car and not using your car. Drinking alcohol and not drinking alcohol. If you ask, look at both sides of the equation, you get more information, more valid information to predict their behavior than if you just look at one side. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with you. Right. Uh, it's a question of what information and paying attention to. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You're exactly right. It's not just a question of, you know, is attitude does one behavior. It's, it's whatever it, you focus your attention on that will tend to influence the decision that you make. So, if you focus people's attentions on both sides of a behavior, it'll influence their decision. Um, 
and so that it will be valuable from your point of view if you want to understand the behavior to look at both sides. The problem from a practical perspective is it doubles the number of questions you have to ask. Right? And so the questionnaire gets very long. And most people don't do it. But if you did, as we did in this study, you find that yes, you can account for additional variance by asking all your questions about both sides. I don't think I need it. Um, don't sit down. Well, I'm not going to give you a present. Okay, <laughs>